Hey, you there. Thank you for watching. And welcome to Forge Lines Forever. Today, I have a 3v3 ladder match here on the most uh, amazing Neuroxis map generator. Let's go ahead and introduce our teams and our players. Starting off with Team Blue, also known as Team 1 in the Northwest. Ending with Red Team, also known as Team 2 in the Southeast. Starting off with Team 1's southernmost player, we have Geneva Check. Was going first land as a UEF in Stitch Blue. He is a 16-18 rating. The highest rated player on Team 1, just barely, and highest rated player overall, also just barely. To his east, we have Esma Noob going first land as a Cybran in Amethyst Purple. He is a 1278 rating going first land. And in the rear guard slide here for Team 1 is Ferv going first land as a UEF in Royal Blue. He is a 1610 rated player that Geneva Check was just barely beats out for highest rated on Team and game overall. He's also going second to air. So for Team 1 side of the map, they have two UEF and one Cybran. That is it. They have no Aeon and no Seraphim for Team 1. Running off with Team 2 is a rear guard slot player of Santamine going first land, second air in Chevy Crimson. He is a Cybran at a 15.47 rated. To his north in orange, the color orange is Rekathur going first and first land, second air as a Cybran as well as a 13.89 rated. And rounding out Team 2's roster is the final Cybran player for Team 2. It is... Zwire Zach going first land, second air. He is a 1588 rated, the highest rated player in on Team 2 in Ruby Red. Which means for Team 2, they not only do not have UEF tech, they also don't have Aeon and Seraphim as well. Which means overall for the game, there are no Aeon and no Seraphim players represented. Apologies to those loyal to the Princess and those who love to make grand entrances, who, who arrive late but love to make grand entrances. Hopefully you will enjoy the game nonetheless, even though you do not have any representatives in said game. And obviously as well, Team 1, again, has the only UEF in the game. Team 2 only has Cybrans, which can be a benefit, can be a hindrance, depending on, you know, just essentially versatility and, you know, the fact if somebody on Team 2 dies, there's no issue of different types of units because of faction-wise or, you know, when you... You know, double click on all of your land factories. It's not only selecting that, you know, Cybern or Seraphim or whatever. It's selecting all of them. So that is a benefit, but the downside is you don't really have a breadth of units to really work with because you only have that faction's units. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and see how much mass our players have to scoop up. And currently still on the map, they have 10,000 mass per... No, that wasn't 10,000 mass per player. That'd be a lot of mass. But 10,000 mass overall, which means it's 1.7k mass per player. Decent amount of mass to scoop up. As well as, honestly, not really a lot of mechs to grab as well. We see quad mechs. It's being a little bit generous over there in the south. Quad mechs over there as well. And a trimex as well for the eastern side and a dual mechs in the middle. So not really a whole lot of mechs outside of those major groupings. And with that out of the way, I'm going to slow it back down because the action has already kicked off. Team 2 has dropped a nice little forward operating base here against Ferv and Team 1 in general. He has come to deal with this. Lots of P Team 1 factories trying to be spanned up. Unfortunately, not really going to do a lot of damage to Ferv's commander. And he'll be perfectly fine dealing with these units very quickly. But I love the aggressiveness outbound from Team 2. They just couldn't make it materialize just because one com came in and said... Hi, and then immediately said bye. In the west, we see Geneva Checkways moving on the west edge of the left, try, trying to go all the way south and then move eastward, trying to eliminate an avenue or a nice or an angle of attack. T2 coming online to deal with any sort of incursions that could come from Team 2. And we see in the east, there's essentially nothing going on here in the northeastern corner of the map, making this essentially null and void. I mean, there's one mech there and one mech there, but it can easily be grabbed by multiple directions. So, and probably not going to see a lot of action. It'd be really funny to see just the, you know, oh wow, the camera freaked out there for a second. A nice little radar system over here just to get a little bit of vision or a little bit of uh, intel gathering. But honestly, it's not really going to do a whole lot in that corner of the map. That base somehow still online for Team 2's Ruby Red play of Zwire Zach, but it looks like Ferv is just reclaiming it very slowly. It does spend mass 
There's Wire's Axe, so it does pull away a little bit more resources somewhere else. But some of those units do get around the comm. And units outbound from Esmo Noob have to fall back to deal with this. So even though this base was pretty much forced into a corner quite literally and figuratively, due to the fact that Sinji is in a, Sinji in a corner and the comm is on top of it, going to take out the last facility there. These units have gotten in and taken out a couple of mexes for Team 1, so it hurt the eco a little bit. How much mass did Zwirzak spend to get that? Well, that's a story that I have no idea because he produced a decent amount of units, and it's kind of hard to... I mean, you could probably track it, but then that'd be the only thing I'd be focusing on is just counting. That's not really very entertaining, but was it worth it? Probably not. Was it annoying? Definitely. So mainly now about was the annoyance worth the price paid so we'll see as time goes on if it was or not t2 air has been established by both teams of course the players that i would expect to be the air players are the air players no uh changing up of you know esma noob or geneva check was going for air it is the rear guard air slot it isn't always but you know they just have to check it just in case Damage range has been started for Geneva Checklist again. Trying to establish a nice front line, getting a decent amount of T1 land facilities online. Surrounding those mexes to really reduce the mass consumption. And just really trying to spam out as many units to roam around the map here. Team 2 electing for a little bit more of a conservative approach, at least in this regard. Getting some T1 PD online and now going for T2 upgrade on board to Wires X Commander. Unfortunately, his PD are being outranged by some Lobos. So unfortunately for him, he'll have to move in and deal with those himself or some units. It does look like transport laden with some engineers coming in to assist him on that front line. Once that upgrade finishes, he's probably gonna go for some Cerberus PD very, very quickly. First major engagement in the Northeast here between Rekather and Esmo Noob's forces. Doesn't look like the comms engaging directly, but there's a little bit of a run by possibility, not really, but tried to occur here by Esmo Noob on this Eastern side. Killed off a couple of mexes, but again, more annoying than anything else and now wall section is going to be established to curtail the movement and actually <laughs> and it's going to build them all on top of that uh mountainside i don't even know if he can get up there i mean he can probably build up to here and then that's probably all he can get and he has to probably cancel it and move them around but we do see in the west with the two comps here from team two they can easily push against geneva checklist which is one of the reasons why he's spamming up so many units is that he knows those comms are there and he really needs those defenses. Unfortunately, the longer this goes on, it will favor Team 1 just because of the fact that there's more units. T2 is going to be on the cards here pretty shortly, and that missile launch is going to be online. So any sort of fire base without Team D is going to be wrecked. So definitely something to watch out here. I don't think there's going to be any snipes as of yet, but definitely one of those instances where we could see... In early departure we do see also ferv coming in to assist as well so as this goes on as well there's going to be two comms here for team one which will outnumber team two not only necessarily in unit counts but also just in firepower in general just due to the fact that again more units means more targets which means not as much uh ways to escape any sort of you know face-to-face -face engagement stealth has been completed by esma noob in the north maybe he'll go for nano but he's going to start with stealth first. I kind of like the pulsing that uh, the stealth gives to give an effect that like it's de trying to essentially defer any sort of radar signatures. Definitely like that kind of effect that's going on. But now we see Rekather employing the same tactic that Esmo Noob did and just using the northeastern section of the map that's, again, devoid of everything. So it's no man's land over here. Trying to use as much of the map as possible doesn't always happen but it is nice to see players use upgrade not use upgrades i read upgrade over there use sections of the map that not really being guarded as a way to get ahead on their opponents there is a decent amount of mixtures of units there's some sky slammers in here as well as some mantis and medusa but again it's only team one units and it's not that many and most of those forces for esmo noob are going to be able to in just essentially protect any sort of engagements outbound from Rekather moving westward. Nano is done as well, so his comms been getting pretty beefy, and Rekather has already left his front line, which may be a good thing or not. We do see in the west, Geneva Czech was pushing forward against Sandalman and Zwirzak. 
There is one T2 Cerberus online. That is it. More PD are being built as we speak. Sandalman has no upgrades and Zwyzak only has the T2 engineering suite. But with the missile launcher, gun, and T2, that comm is pretty bulky and he does have one star. If the engineer gets destroyed, Zwyzak is going to be surrounded. He will be fine. But again, it's not looking good here for Team 2. There's really nothing here that they can use to fight back. Missile outbound going to go after some mexes. Trying to target Zwyzak's commander directly doesn't lead the target as much. Now Zwyzak has to worry about a missile that's going to be launched at him pretty quickly. Missile now reloaded. And it's going to probably fire against some sort of these mexes down here in the south. Most of them are T1, but I would be surprised to see upgrades started here pretty shortly. Let's do this trimax position over here. T2 land has been established. Rhino starting to pop up here for Zwyzak. T3 air has been, sorry, T3 land and air has been established by Team 2. Very, very interesting here. That upgrade went by very, very quickly. And everybody on Team 2 has some sort of T3 online. Team 1 has T3 air, but nobody in T2 land territory. T3 has been started on the northern side for Esma Noob. So that will definitely favor Team 2. So Team 2 elects to hold off on T2 land production in favor of the more... Up, not upgraded, but the more teched up units of the T3 variety. Missile launcher outbound once again here from Geneva Check was going to kill off. I think this T2 max is what it's going for, but there is a zapper nearby. Looks like it already got zapped even before it reached its main target. And we do see these Loyalists with the missile redirect systems on board. So those missiles from Geneva aren't going to get a lot more value out of them, especially with those Loyalists running around. So like just fleeing in the face of this. Of course, Geneva has to be very con very cautious of how far he pushes in because Team 2 could easily get some gunships or T3 units really just kind of concentrated, full send it very quickly, and that could be the death of Team 1's commander there. So again, he's still pushing in. He's getting pretty close to the main base of his wire, Zach. Gun damage, and sorry, gun speed and range has been started for Sano Man. He's now being assisted by more of his engineers. And look at this, there's a lot of momentum going on Team 1's side, but again, both in the East and in the West, Team 2 is losing a lot of territory, but they have the ability to be able to try to snipe a comm very easily because of how far away they are from their main defenses. We see these Loyalists online really ripping through all of these Mantis because of their fast movement and how fast they fire as well. There's also a brick nearby, so very tanky here. T3 being pumped out very, very quickly out of this facility here by Rekether. All of these units are essentially going to their deaths. They're going to try to kill off as much as they can, but Team 2 heavily focused on T3 land and air, and it might be what saves them at least early on. Here is Geneva Checkers going after the comms with Wirezek and Sandman. Sandman finishes the gun upgrade. Looks like Checkwist is going after all the engineers, building more PD support. There are a decent amount of pillars here, but those PD are now focusing on the Geneva Checkwist commander, and Zwarzak retreats. He doesn't really have anything to face that commander with. Team 2 is still falling back, but again, look how far Geneva Checkwist is pushing in. I don't think he should be going this far in. I mean, Team 2, they are getting some of those Corsairs online. It could be an easy snipe. We do see Sandman receiving a lot of the focus fire from all of these pillars. There could be an early evacuation on the cards here. Sandman, that this might actually be his death at this point. He is in the red. This is his death. All those pillars are going to go up in smoke. There they go. One survives the initial explosion. And now Whaler nearby. And that is the first death in the game at 15 minutes. Geneva Checklist gets a nice little radar online. There's no AA around him. Team 1 needs to get some interceptors or something over here. ASFs are called to deal with this. Whaler is not uh, defenseless. It does have some AA on board. ASF coming to deal with the interceptors. Now ASF from Ferv coming to deal with those ASF. But again, Geneva Checklist again is very far forward. Look at this. Look, this is where his base is. He is all the way down here. That is a long walk back, even a long flight back on a, on a transport. That is a huge risk he's taking. So far it's played off. He has killed a player on team two. It's a 3v2 in favor of his team. Missiles outbound now going over here, going for these T2 mexes that are unguarded by TMD. More TMD are being built. I think that's, no, that's a zapper, yeah. That uh, T2 mex will be killed off, but 
the attack outbound from the east from Esma Noob doesn't really get anywhere, unfortunately. It is now being blitzed down by some loyalists. More units coming in all the time here from Record to push back Team 1. As Team 1 gains territory in the south, they are starting to lose territory in the north. We even see Ferv's commander coming in to assist. He's getting a decent amount of mexes here. That should be technically Team 2's mexes, but that's not really the case at this point. More of these mexes here are being taken up by that missile launcher, missile launcher capable commander of Geneva. If he goes for Billy Nuke right here, that might just be the game if he decides to go for that investment. If he's going to go this far forward, he might as well just go for Billy Nuke and call it a day. He has a decent amount of units in defense. He does have, of course, a couple of the para shields that he can use. He does also can just spam up shields with his engineers nearby. He has a really good plethora of options to go for, but is being a little bit cautious. He's not pushing even further. Oh, okay, we'll scratch that. He is going to push at least a little bit further in. At least far enough in for those uh, missile launchers to be able to target this firebase that Zwarzak is building. Some of those servers are not defended. Needs more Team D in that base. And that uh, outpouring of forces outbound from Rekather definitely dies down, but now he's sending them away from the commander over here. This firebase that was online for Esmanu essentially destroyed. There's still a couple of land facilities, but that's about it. This is where most of the action for Team 1 in a positive direction is occurring. And more missiles taking out T2 Mexes one by one by one. Looks like there's some reclaim, not power issues possibly here for Team 1. Uh, looks like, yeah, a little bit of power issues for Ferv and for Geneva Checklist, but looks like they're fixing their eco. So it looked like they were at 500, but now they're at 300, so it's probably due to that. Now they're at 400, so yeah, it's probably a power-related issue. Anyway, air grid being expanded. Monkey Lord is online. If Team 1's Geneva doesn't notice that the monkey, that monkey knows what it's targeting. It's going for that commander. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about its mission. It will be finished before 20 minutes. And that, uh, that comm most likely will die unless Team 1 notices this, which there are some spy planes flying overhead. Don't know if they'll see that Monkey Lord. That's going to be very devastating for Geneva if he does not start to flee. T2 shields are going to be built around that commander just for some protection. Air scouts will... Nope, still haven't seen that Monkey Lord as of yet. Still has a decent ways to go. You can see it going back and forth. And it's not really that convenient because it's really allowing a lot of time for those AA to track that uh, air unit. But again, same thing over here. The, the spy planes don't go as far south. If they did, they would have seen that monkey fluid and that may have forced the Neva checklist to be like, that's probably not a good idea that I'm gonna sit this far forward. He's still been building a nice fire base, trying to establish a frontline position. T3 has been started. He's going to start to PD creep with that, uh, you know, the T3 Ravager that the UEF have access to. But, again, it's going to be very dangerous if he decides to sit there long term. Let's see when he spots it. He hasn't seen it yet. We'll probably see it shortly. If he's paying attention to what those cannons are, he'll know what they are. He does see the Monkey Lord just barely. He is on that upgrade. But again, it's one of those things where if he doesn't move probably now, he's probably going to die. You never check was still on that upgrade. Monkey Lord coming in. He's not going to stop. He's going to be escorted by those bricks. He even needs to cancel that upgrade immediately. He might be busy doing something else. He does see that Monkey Lord and go, nah, I'm see you, bye. But that Monkey Lord is going to chase him down. Monkey Lord is probably going to get one star of entrancy before he even gets to that calm. You never takes out a chunk of those hit points. It's not going to matter. Titan is nearby. Probably needed a couple more Percy's or a decent amount more Titans than that. Unfortunately, the laser on board the monkey not targeting the comm. The laser, there it goes, now targeting the comm. And that uh, monkey will barely survive that. Gets a rank in veterancy with the death of Team 1's Geneva Checklist and is now a 2v2 game. And again, one of those things where he stayed too far forward. Team 2 built a response to it. And there he went. Monkey Lord will probably barely survive that engagement, but it's done its job. This will force back Team 1 for being assaulted by some Corsairs. He does have some ASF to protect him, so good on him for bringing his air forces. There are some bricks moving in. ASF cannot target ground units, so that's not really going to work. He does take a decent amount of damage, so 
He needs to retreat, especially with that Munkaloo that's almost dead. That's not going to be sent forward. Actually, you probably could have sent it forward and maybe killed it off, but it would dump mass closer to Team 1. It's probably not a good idea. I do, <laughs> I do love this, though. <laughs> There's an engineer building PD on a cliff. Overcharge kills off essentially both of those PD, but I, I love it because it's like, hey, you're retreating? Oh, yeah, there's um, some enemy emplacements up there, and uh, you got to watch out for that. There are more units streaming in to close the gap here. But with this, I mean, Team 1 has a huge advantage in the southwestern section of the map. All of that mass, all of that reclaim that's over here, I mean, it's given them a huge amount of mass income here team one sitting at 475 team two at 470 team one has two players left genie of check was being killed off earlier on and sentiment being the first departed for team two bricks are moving into range of ferb's commander but he does have overcharge he should be fine he's going to take a lot of damage he might drop into the red but does get a rank and almost gets a rank in veteran so he will get a rank in veteran so with this next kill and it is close. Had there been probably two or three more bricks, that might have been enough to kill Ferv off, but just barely escapes from that. Anyways, Team 2, Team 1, I mean, definitely map control favors Team 1, but there's a lot of unrealized gains here for Team 1 just with the death of Geneva Checklist. But let me know down in the comments who you think is going to currently win this game at 22 minutes and 26 seconds on the clock. Thank you so very much for watching to this point in the video. And, of course, if you haven't done so already, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I really do appreciate all the time and attention you give, not only to myself, but to all of the FAF creators in the community. There's not that many of us, but we love the game. And we want anyone and everyone who would enjoy this type of game to watch it. So please, please share this video and all of my videos and everybody's videos in general, if you are so inclined to do so. Idle says Geneva. Oh, just talking about how there's some facilities that are idle. And Team 2's records are starting to push back on Team 1 on this northern side. Of course, is facing a decent amount of brick walls to uh, impede his progress. So those units not really uh, numbering in the numbers that he needs to. And even if they did, they're essentially just sending mass to Team 1's front line. You really need a crab to really punch through this part of the map, or any part of the map, to be fair, at this point. And there are no colossi. There are no chickens. Team 1 has fat boys. That's it. You only have monkeys, crabs, and fat boys for land experimentals. So, might as well use what you got. It does look like the monkey has returned to base. Just going to slowly wrap up. It's going to be a while. 50,000 hit points out of, you know, obviously 7,000 out of 50,000. So, it's going to be a while. More hives being built here to assist with the construction of something, I would imagine. Maybe he's going to go for early scathis or artillery or something or nuke. In these types of ladder games, usually SMDs aren't really built to about the 25, 30 minute mark. So an early nuke would be huge for either team. If anything, I could see Team 2 doing it more than Team 1 because they're not necessarily more desperate, but they're, you know, they're on the back foot a little bit with mask generation game. I mean, they're starting to close the gap, but it's still a little bit of an uphill battle. They're being attacked in the southwest by a decent T3 army. And, of course, the ASFs are leading the game as well for Team 1. The, I think it's probably air control territory at this point. 46 ASFs versus Wirezax. Nine? Yeah, that looks like nine. So, I mean, it's heavily favoring Team 1. The benefit for Team 2 is that Team 1's coming to attack them, so the mass is coming to them instead of the other way around. I do like this drop in the southwest. I wish there was more AA. There's some gunships in here that's really going to rip through whatever remains over here. And it's, I'd like the attempt executed. Not, not great. I did like that Monkey Lord play. That was essentially the only thing that was going to crack those defenses. Had those units been T3 from Geneva, that Monkey Lord would not have stood a chance. Would not have. It would have been killed probably even before it reached the calm. We see in the east another Monkey Lord coming online here for a wreck there. I feel like he should skip this and go for Crab just for that extra range. He really needs something to shoot that will not take damage, at least in this engagement. Team 1, are you building any experimentals as of yet? No, it looks like, oh, no, building a fat boy back here by Ferv. Getting a quantum gateway to expand out his uh, mass fab generation. Well, not mass fab, but his mass generation. Least amount of E storage is just for some overcharge. But this attack, I mean, I like the attempt, but it's 
it's not really it's not gaining anything one way or the other it's just killing units off which is useful but the further essentially it's like the war of attrition the further you go into enemy territory and the more units you lose the less effective it is if anybody's played risk you definitely know what i'm talking about with the sense of every time you take a piece of territory you have to leave units behind and eventually at some point you can't move anymore because all your units have been called to defense duty so it's just it's hard to really just kind of steamroll your opponent unless you just have an overwhelming force, which at 26 minutes on a ladder match, you're not going to have that much. It's mainly just going to be preventing expansion, annoying a little bit, that sort of thing. Not necessarily, I'm, I'm going to steamroll into your base and kill you and make the game end kind of thing. But these Percy's and uh, Titans and a couple of missile launchers making a point of just trying to force Wirezack back. That missile, that missile, that monkey load is online. We'll get a little bit more veteran see from this might get to three, uh, sorry, two stars to be able to get more hit points on board, which will su make him survive a lot easier. He is sitting underneath a little bit of shield coverage, and the T1 land facility is acting as a nice little buffer for him. More PD being built just constantly. Second, Regency is online. More hit points available to him and more, of course, regen as well. Percy is falling back a little bit, targeting the bricks. The monkey lord should have been the one targeted, but... Uh, it was not, and the monkey little will stay alive. Now it's at 24,000, and now repping at 60 hit points a second, so it, it makes a huge difference getting your experimentals in veterancy. Of course, the higher the star count, the better, but this attack still punching through for Team 2, for on Team 2, from Team 1. Monkey little almost done in the east for record threat. Will be enough to probably force essentially a nice uh, you know, stalemate. But well, there's more and more units arriving all the time for Esmo. He's putting the pressure down. And Team 2 essentially just hemming him in, essentially saying, hey, don't go this way, there's PD. Don't go this way. Just continue to go straight for the main base. And if they expanded, see, the problem is the more they essentially try to just scalpel straight on through, every single time I play a ladder match, our highest rank goes AFK. What? He's not going AFK. He's just doing stuff. Crab has been started here by Zwirezak. Sad face says Esmo Noob. I mean, it might feel that way. I mean, looking like this, it might feel that way. But he is going for a crab. And he's expanding his air grenade out a little bit. Monkey Lord doing a very good job of dealing with these bricks. And records are building another Monkey Lord. Have you tried... <laughs> have you tried... Have you tried the thing that would make you feel better by winning? No, it doesn't look like it. The Monkey Lord from the south, from Zyre, is why Zach will come and assist. Distract a little bit of those bricks. Again, more veterancy for this Monkey Lord. Needs more hit points, more regen, and uh, longer lifespan, essentially. And this monkey going here from Record Third should just push northward. There are some PD trying to distract those incoming reinforcing bricks, and has done a great job of that so far. Your gunships saved him, says Record Third, and then I had to build some sort of air. My gunship killed one T3 unit. I pulled my units back. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of conversation between Record Third and Ferv. Which, to be fair, having a conversation with someone on the other team and doing stuff at the same time is very difficult. So, I don't think I can do that, but uh, some players can. Because you got to, like, type really, really quickly. And he, and it's, like, not just a couple... It's not just one or two messages. It's, like, an entire, you know, communication line. It's, like, back and forth, like, entire conversation. And that monkey Lloyd still has not gone northward. Very interesting why it took him so long to send it. He should have sent it sooner. It probably would have been enough to force these units back. Quantum Expedition down once again. And these bricks just constantly steamrolling. And, of course, Engineer's already on station from Esmo Noob to scoop up all of the reclaim. Most of it is his. The decent amount, of course, is Rekather's. He sent one monkey, and I, bull and I bullied before that. The monkey got me, though. Yeah, Geneva, I mean, he did just force Team 2 back and then got killed for it. So... That, I mean, it's not the best strategy. And it does work sometimes, but not all the time. Monkey's just going to cut off any sort of reinforcement. So what's going to happen here is the monkey's going to go north a little bit more. And it should go east. Or it's going to stay here and allow this monkey to come in and deal with these bricks. But they're bricks outbound also from record. They're trying to intercept the remaining bricks from Esmo Noob. Esmo Noob, what are you focusing on now? That, that monkey is going to die. There's too many bricks. It needs to fall back. They push a little bit too far forward, too much firepower, and that mass is going to fall on Team 1's side. Oh, will it make out? Gets a rank in veterancy just barely. 
Will it be enough? It's forcing all the units out of the way, and it will just be barely enough. But I don't agree with this. My goodness, says uh, Rekather, or oh, probably talking about the monkey play. Ras gating in has been started here from Zwirzak. Another monkey online for defense. He could easily send just a couple of bricks just around, killing off all of the T1 mixes around the map. Oh, where is Billy for 30 minutes in? Top, uh, he's just giving, uh, looks like forever a hard time about building a Billy nuke. Huge air facility coming online for him and getting some, those Continentals? I think those are continent. yeah, those are Continentals coming online. I like how compact they are when they are built, because you got to fit them on that platform and then they expand out when they're done. <laughs> Very interesting uh, unit design there. You're like, hmm, I, they can't fit on a normal air facility platform. They'll have to scrunch down in order to uh, actually be built there. But Monkey getting a ton of value. I mean, it, this is the one that killed off the comm. This is the one that defended down there. It's killed off 44,000 mass. Usually a monkey does not survive this long, so good on Zwizek for trying to micro it. It almost died, but it got saved by a rank in veterancy. He builds another experimental. Is it that crab? Yes, it is. Ferv builds its own experimental. Is it a fat boy? Yes, it is. So monkey and fat boy over here. Continentals being spammed up probably for unit transport. And there's a lot of T3 units as well as some parashields in this mix. Love the amount of, t of Percy's in the mix. There's also some Cougars and some Skyboxers. A nice mix of T3 and T2 AA. Honestly, it's a really good unit comp. Maybe a couple of Titans would be nice for some just kind of blitzing down T1 units kind of thing. But besides that, really, really good mix of units at bound from him. And then a smaller squad over there as well. So building multiple groups of land armies. And, the, of course, the reclaim fields definitely favor Team 2, illustrated by the fact that Team 1 has been sending units to Team 2 side of the map, so that would definitely make sense. Mass totals are obviously favoring Team 1 due to the fact that they're now sitting at 1.1k mass income versus essentially 850. Huge difference there, 30 minutes on the clock. There is another, not another, but there's a monkey lord over here. And at this point, with the turret, with the land, you know, how it is... And, just the way I can tell it's a, 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 was it the aspen tree or the pine tree or whatever because it is. But uh, using the territory to his, uh, using the map to his advantage, making all these units go northward and splitting off a small group to deal with a lot easier will get, again, veterancy on board that monkey load a lot quicker. Won't take as much damage and can start whittling down the army a lot better. Now it's coming in one by one essentially and makes it very easy. Had that monkey load continued westward, It'd be dead because all the bricks would be over there and it would have ripped them apart very, very quickly. Now a second one shows up. And with these two, it might be enough to punch through. At this point, with these units split how they are, send both of these monkeys westward for any sort of reinforcing over here and either send what you have down the middle or just continue on westward because there are units being built constantly, but there's not that many. It does look like this monkey lid will have to get out of dodge, though, because there are bricks coming to chase it down. There's not enough firepower from both of these bricks to make a difference. Like both of these uh, monkey lords can make a difference against the bricks. So sending them back would definitely be the better idea. In the southeast, we saw a drop outbound from Ferb going after the air grid here for Zwirzak. And this is huge because with the air down, Team 1 has air dominance. And actually, I'd say air supremacy at this point. T1 PD trying to be spammed up. Corsair is also trying to do what they can to deal with this. But Ryosek has taken hit after hit this game. Loses his teammate early on. Gets, a, of course, a dual base. And then loses that dual base due to some Percy drops. You see one transport didn't even make it with its units. But one of them did, at least. And that was, I mean, Percy's are a really good unit to blitz down air grid. So great move by Ferv. And it's really, you know, kneecapping Team 2's ability to fight in the air. And so now is the situation, does Team 2 spend the effort to just build a bunch of AA and not worry about ASF? Does he just build the air grid back and try to rush it down? What does he do? Because whatever move he reacts to, Team 1 can do something else, but they could build more ASF. They could transition to, you know, Maver, artillery, nukes, any sort of thing. I mean, they already have some fat boys running around the map. They could produce more of those. Transport's being hot dropped on top of those bricks and those, the bricks, on top of those uh, monkeys. And one monkey is down. 
Looks like the second transport gonna drop on top of the rack here. Monkey also nearby here from Esmo to assist. And there goes that second person, second person, second group of persons taken out. That second monkey. ASF's eviscerated by Team One's ASF. And that monkey trying to edge on by. But I don't think it's gonna do so. That monkey's already there. And that uh, Soothsayer is online. He does get killed off, so Team One will lose a lot of vision. There it goes. They had a decent amount more before I obviously clicked on them because the Intel Gathering Station is down. But Team 2 really needs a big ticket item to really bring them back in this game. They need to focus heavily on defense with the death of their monkeys. They need to just fall back. They have a crab. Just keep it for defense. Don't send it in. Obviously, we know that's why. Okay, he has started a Scathus. And it's going to take a while, but if he gets enough time with it I mean, alone, if he has... I mean, you know, just enough time to build it up, actually. It might be enough. Fat Boy is nearby. So he really needs to deal with that. That's going to be the main threat to this. And those uh, that crab could easily just post up up here and destroy that Fat Boy very, very quickly. So and he has to be careful of how long that Fat Boy sits there. Team 1, you know, are you doing anything else? Not as of yet. Just trying to dual ring your mexes. Continentals. I love the Continental plays. Cutting down on the travel time. The Percy's, of course, are a slower unit, so it takes a while to traverse the map. But being able to say, hey, I can get all of these units from here all the way over here in fifth of the time, that's definitely worth the mass investments. Percy's uh, discard, the distract device and engineers, it looks like. Grab and Monkey ripping through the rest of those bricks. And gunships moving in. Team 2 needs some mobile AA immediately. Those broadswords are designed for air-to-ground damage and that is not going to feel good on that monkey's back that is for sure more t1 aa is being spanned up but you need more than that you need flak at a minimum if not t3 to really just deal a blow and that crab somehow zwirzak hurt me from the ether and goes oh yeah that is a good idea i should just stand on top of this plateau and fire on this uh, fat boy and that crab is moving ever so slowly but the benefit is is that fat boy is in range but is being protected by the cliffside. The downside is, if that fat boy starts to retreat, the angle at which those cannons are firing would actually benefit, would actually be better for the crab. Unfortunately, now the fat boy is stuck here, and if he even falls back, it doesn't matter because that fat boy is dead. Going to get blitzed down very, very quickly here. Nice grab here by Team 2. Zwarzak on that fat boy will start deploying some eggs to start spamming some units onto the field to secure that position. A huge amount of gunships inbound on the eastern side of the map. AA needs to be spammed up immediately. Another crab is half done here. Going after the T3 land facilities over here, pumping out all of those bricks. Wreck-A-Third transfers everything over to his teammate of Zwirzak. Maybe we'll see a control K, maybe we won't. But those gunships are on a mission and they're gonna run right into that comm. That comm is not gonna have a good time. 38 minutes on the clock. We might see another departure here. AA being spammed up as quickly as it can be. And there he goes. He control case even before the gunships reach, which means not a lot of them get damaged by that Inferno, dropping this game to a 2v1. And that AA not enough to deal as enough damage to those gunships to prevent the loss of T3 Mexes. How's that Scathus doing? It's in the yellow, over 25%, over 33%. Go over a third of the way there. He needs bouncers. He needs T3. He needs T2. Multiple engineers producing those SAM facilities to try to curtail these gunships. ASF's also built to try to just deal with them. It will be enough, but the mission is done. Team 1's killed off another player on Team 2, which means it now goes from a, an annihilation game to an assassination game. And I feel like ladder matches are naturally designed to be assassination games anyways in the sense of you're targeting the comms, not necessarily everything the comms have. Because the downside with bigger matches, or bigger team matches, essentially if you kill a player off, all of their stuff usually goes to somebody else. So you're not really killing them off. You're just killing off a player, not what they had. But in this case, you kill off three players, that's it, game over. So it's not as bad as a, uh, a hill to climb if one player gets dual base or even triple base in this case, because Unless that player can significantly outproduce, out build, out whatever, out eco you, you should be fine to just target the comms directly. So again, but that is the the risk that you take with going just for comms versus going after everything that they own. 
So different strategies for different folks. But again, like I said, obviously 1v1s are assassination games because you kill the com off and that's it. Game over. Kind of same thing with 2v2s. But in 3v3s and 4v4, especially in ladders, it's definitely one of those do you go for the kill? Is it worth it? What's At what point in the game is it? Will that make a difference if they have dual bases at this point? Where Maver Dan says Geneva checklist. He's like, where? Oh, there it is. It's right there. It's being built right now. So now it's a race to who can build the game into first. I think the Scathus will be spotted at this point by Team 1 if it hasn't already begun. It does say it has been started here by Team 1. So they definitely know about it, but it is now sitting at over... Oh, yeah, it's been sitting over 66% revenge of the engineer. <laughs> what is going on over here? <laughs> Two out of three. There's uh, Geneva Check was just illustrating to his teammates that, hey, it's two out of three. It means it's 66% uh, done. And those engineers are running around the map scooping everything up. There's no units, at least offensive units down here. So, yeah, it's just spamming up engineers at that point. Oh, please tell me you're going to capture that. No, you need to you need to capture it. Don't reclaim it. Ah, oh, disappointing. Disappointing. It was a perfect opportunity to capture that facility, but no, no one really does that anymore. One crab has been defeated and a monkey as well being overwhelmed by the best T3 land unit in the game, the Percy. Just look at all the damage, even at a you know two-star veteran seed megalith, even at a five-star, this thing would have been destroyed pretty quickly. New monkey coming in new range. But there goes the crab. The crab going to crash land onto some Percy's. They're going to do some damage, so that's going to help out. Bricks coming in to assist. Monkey is in the yellow, though. Needs to be careful. Can be blitzed down very quickly. And now, essentially, it has turned from a land game to a how fast can you build a game into a game. And the Scathis is almost done. It's in the green, over 75% completed. How's that Maver doing for Team 1? It is still in the red, under 25%. It's going to be a minute for him to finish that. Did Ferv end up going for that Bilinuk? He does have the... No, that's just the regular one. That's not the, that's not the Bilinuk. We have the little nuke symbol next to it, if it was. And again, here's the downside for Team 1. They have to walk all of their units all the way through Team 2's base, all to their defenses. They could go south, but Team 2's going to see that a lot easier with the nonsense of engineers. There are some Percy's coming in to say, hey, not okay if you just reclaim the battlefield down here. This is mine. And does drop off. Look look how tall that Percy is compared to that engineer. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> uh, this is just, I will reclaim you. Come here. I will reclaim you. <laughs> Revenge of the engineer. And that uh, engineer obviously gets destroyed quite quickly. But it is funny to just watch a tiny little unit. It's like an ant trying to you know, attack a giant at this point with one giant arm. Engineers just trying to reclaim, try to get a little bit of income. And that Scathis has been completed. 42 minutes on the clock. And what is it targeting is the question. That's what's going to matter at this point is the amount of value that Svarzak can get out of that Scathis. It is targeting. What is it targeting? Uh, it's pretty short of that air grid. Don't tell me you're targeting the comm. That would be... You don't even know what the comm is, so you wouldn't even be able to target it. I don't know what he's trying to hit. I mean, you would probably want to target the center of that air grid. But I don't know what he's exactly... Because it looks like it's not targeting the center of it. Like, it's targeting this T3 mechs right here, essentially. Because you can see most of the shots are landing essentially right here. So that's roughly where he's targeting. It's very weird that he's not going after the air grid or anything else. I mean, I guess he's trying to, like, take out the mass. But Furf has a decent amount of... Rascom, so it's really not going to make a huge difference. Team 1 almost doubling the output of Team 2's mass at 1.7, 1.8k versus 1,000. Grab online here for Esma Noob just pushing back Team 2 on this eastern side. It's just going to be the war of attrition at this point. How long can Team 2's Wirezak hold out? How long can that Scathus, you know, just rip apart Team 1? Essentially, at this point, you need to go for the means of production. Take out all of those ex you know, mass extractors if you can. If not, take out all of the facilities at a minimum. Slow down that production scheme. And now he's retasking onto the units inbound. There's so many units moving around, it's not really going to mean a whole lot. Maybe you'll do some damage to the crab, but I don't think it's really worth it at this point. Monkey Lord's being spammed up as quickly as they can be. These bricks are moving in as well, going after the crab. 
Hard OP land, Dan says. You uh, need a checklist. I mean, again, kind of biased, but Percy is the best T3 land unit in the game, so it really just rips apart. It's designed to take out you know, very high HP units. That being the crab, the monkey, all of those types of units, all the experimentals. It's meant to blitz them down very quickly in large numbers. So, I mean, that's what it's doing right now. You can see, look at look at the hit points just fall on that crab. Not even at one star veterancy yet, and just ripping apart all of those hit points. There goes the monkey over there. Janus, oh no, look at ASF. Both of those experimentals are down. Crab, no, sorry, monkey being blitzed down very quickly though. That's not going to do a whole lot, unfortunately. It's essentially just how long can Team 2 hold out. Gathos needs to keep firing on whatever it can fire on. The air grid has taken damage, but isn't enough. Now it's targeting this air grid over here for Esmo Noob. He needs to just blitz down one person and then focus on something else. The Mavor is in the yellow, so it's over 50% completed. And Ferv now going to hide underneath some shield coverage. Nope, he's just going to walk back and forth, it looks like. Rarzak doesn't know where he is, so I'm kind of interested to see why he's targeting this. I mean, it does kind of clip into the the quantum gateways over here. And trying to take out as much as he can. Mass Fabs are still alive, but they are hurting, so got to watch out for the volatile explosions. Looks like the monkey was built and immediately destroyed. Pigeons are going down, possibly a facility for a disruptor, but that's not going to go anytime soon. And Scath is still pumping out. Okay, now I can see what he's targeting directly. He's just targeting the middle, trying to get a nice little AOE on everything. Tanks out the Quantum Gateway and the Mass Fabs. Great grab here by Zwirzak, but he still has a long way to go. He needs to take out the air grid and the air grid up here. This air grid is still online. Mavor is almost in the green. I'll even know if he knows about that. Doesn't know about it. Needs to get some uh, spy planes online. But there's a group of gunships moving in. And they are probably going to go after that Scathis. Here they come. They're in the distance. AA needs to be spammed up immediately. There's also the comm sitting there as well. Here come the whalers. Scathis firing. Is it going to be enough to crack the shield? And the whalers are falling pretty quickly, though. There are some ASMs that have been built up there by Zwirzak. And most of those gunships do get taken out. But not a lot of damage gets done to Zwirzak's base. But it just goes to show he needs more defenses in one way or the other. Units still coming down on the eastern edge of the map. And at this point, I think it's just going to be a hook maneuver. Take out everything on the eastern edge and push west. That's a sandwich. Dwyer's deck between the ASF and the uh, units on the western side and everything else on the eastern side. Huge amount of spy planes are outbound. And they are being spread around. Looks like ASFs might try to catch up, but uh, will not. Because those spy planes are pretty quick. And those units are still pushing on the eastern edge. Looks like they're trying to catch up. Team 2 will get a decent amount of intel gathering from this. But uh, I don't think they'll get enough. They won't see the Maver, at least as of right now. No, they need to move a little bit more westward. Gath is still targeting the remains of Esmo's base. I mean, it is ripped to shreds. Ferv is still... You know, he took some shots, but it's perfectly fine. Not really worried about a whole lot. Building up some uh, triads for some Telemazer defense. I don't even know if uh, Zwarzak went... No, he just has T3 and Stealth. Doesn't have cloaking or anything of the sort. Here come those crabs in from the east. It's not looking good here. That Scathus wasn't as effective as it could have been. Yep, that's definitely something that I'm uh, pointing out here. It's been up for 10 minutes or so, but it's taken out one base. Don't know if he knows that the... And now he's targeting this base right here. It's not really doing a whole lot. I do love that this is just where the fat boy was sitting. And those engineers are going to feel it. There they come. Oh, a chunk of those engineers are down. Another chunk of those engineers are down, but it's the land side of things. Strap bombers over the top will not kill the Scathis off. We'll take out some of the shielding, but still a second attempt outbound from the air from Team 1 is not enough. Monkey still online. We'll probably get blitzed down as those Percy's run on by. SMD has been, has been built, but will get destroyed. SMD here is going to be perfectly fine, but that crab is moving in. If Zwirzak can hold which I don't think you can with the two crabs, three crabs, plus all the units. 
if he can hold, it might be enough for Team 2 to win this, but he is completely just devoid of resources. 300 mass a second and falling. Pigeons are falling as well. Scath is firing constantly. Again, it costs power to run the Scath. There's more power going down. And it's not looking good. The shields are down as well. All it's going to take is a couple of strat bombers, which more are inbound. So even if the land units don't kill it off, the strat bombers will. And it's just going to be a nice little just survival game at this point. The base is going down. Monkey is down. Scath is what will you be killed by? Possibly the land units, possibly the strat bombers. Strat bombers are inbound. They will get the target. And some of those strat bombers will die, but that is it. The Scathus is down. Excuse me. Says Geneva checklist. Oh. Where laser defense is. <laughs> He's just giving Ferb a hard time at this point. Uh, reclaiming efforts to get rid of all these bricks by these hives. Love the uh, micro here. Just trying to do what he can. No E says Marzek. I mean, you didn't have a lot of things, to be fair. And he's just going to get chased down. There it goes. Marzek trying to get out of range of all of those bricks, but he doesn't even have the range upgrade on board that commander, which means it's just going to be a one-sided fight. Crabs are in range, and there he goes. He is killed off by Team 1's Esmo Noob. And that will be the game. Team 1 wins this fight with two players remaining. And I feel like Ferv gets the MVP. Well, oh, I don't know. I don't know because Esmo Noob did a very good job of keeping the pressure on. I think Esmo Noob might have this. He kept Team 2 at bay. Did have a little bit of some incursions to deal with, but kept Team 2 at bay. Kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. If it was just the air situation, I don't think Ferv would have cracked those shields. Had the obviously these units been down here, that Scathus definitely could have been used a lot better. The air grid wasn't even like it wasn't shielded at all. He was targeting this. The Scathus doesn't have a range on it, so I don't know why he wasn't hitting at stuff back here. And that would have taken out the air. He would have not had to worry about that. But the problem was was the land side of things just really got to Team Two, and really is what uh, won the game for Team One. I feel like so. I think Esmanub deserves MVP. Sorry, Ferv, you almost got it just barely. You did build a Mavor. You did build that, but uh, I don't even know if you fired that or not. Did you fire that? I don't even know if you fired. Uh, looks like it was just built too. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's I think it's about ready to fire but I don't see any shots that would indicate that no because that's that's strap bombers that's a hole in the ground and that's the come yeah I don't see any artillery shells anywhere but again let me know down in the comments who you felt deserved MVP in this game or not and of course if you haven't done so already like the video and subscribe to the channel thank you so very much for watching and I will see all of you in the next one